you know, no matter what diet you're on, there's going to be certain potential deficiencies. Like if you're in a plant-based diet, you know, vitamin B can be a ba- major challenge. Obviously, if you're in a keto, a hardcore carnivore type diet, you might have some other deficiencies like vitamin C or some other antioxidants. So no matter what diet you're on, you got to kind of ideally be smart about it because there's people following plant-based diets or, or any diet that are just not paying attention to the micronutrients. And there's certain micronutrients like magnesium and potassium that are just. Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today it is my pleasure to have Matt Gallant with us. Matt is the CEO and co-founder of Bioptimizers, along with his fellow co-founder, Wade Lightheart, who was also a guest on this podcast. Matt has a bachelor's degree in kinesiology. He's been a strength and conditioning coach for multiple pro athletes, a self-defense instructor. He's also had over 15 years of experience formulating supplements. And Matt is a serial entrepreneur that's built over 13 profitable companies. Matt, it's so great to have you on the show. Phil, I'm in the right place. You know, get yourself optimized is definitely a... One of the things I spend the most time thinking about, and of course, we met at a biohacking event. Here we are. Here we are. There are no coincidences. <laughs> so let's start with how you ended up getting into this biohacking world. Was there some sort of transformative event, some sort of tragedy or dark night of the soul or something? You're like, okay, I got to get my body into peak shape, or was it just like a, I don't know, just an unfolding? Yeah, I think it was three key events. The first one was, you know, my my father bought me a weight set when I was 12, but I only became obsessed when I was like 16 and I was on the beach and I saw two huge bodybuilders and I'm like, okay, I I feel weak and feeble. I need to, to put on some muscle mass and the bodybuilding bug bit me and I became absolutely obsessed with, with bodybuilding and went from like 147 to, to 235 in three years, training twice a day. And it was kind of a fascinating experience to be able to to put on that much muscle mass. And I lost 64 pounds in 14 weeks getting ready for a show. And, it, you know, the ability to change your body that drastically was really fascinating. The second big one was my grandfather got hit by a car. It was a hit and run. He got hit when he was 75. And then I just saw his health decline very rapidly. My father built an apartment for him. He moved in with us and spent the last few years of his life. And, you know, he literally prayed for death multiple times a day because he was suffering so much. And that was really impactful. You know, that was um, seeing how critical health is and what the consequences are when you lose it is uh, definitely changes your perspective on things. And then uh, the big one that really made me decide that this is what I want to do for a career was helping my best friend lose 191 pounds in 18 months. I was around 19 at the time. And then that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to help people. So yeah, I built a couple of successful personal training companies, one on the East Coast of Canada, Moncton, New Brunswick, and then moved to Vancouver, did it again there. And Wade and I struck a friendship and we launched Bioptimizers in 2004. Uh, At the time, we were really focused on helping natural bodybuilders. Wade was competing at the time and Wade had a really unique story where he was competing as a vegetarian. You know, this is 2004. Nobody was talking about using vegetarian diets at the time. And yeah, it was successful. And then over time, our passion for bodybuilding waned and we became more, you know, obsessed, if you will, with health. And we rebranded to Bioptimizers in 2014. What was the most important milestone in by optimizers in that business since 2004. If you look right behind me above my head, that's a Inc. 5000 plaque. We've been the third fastest growing supplement company in America for the last three years. So that was a cool milestone. You know, what really excites me personally is actually more of the, the breakthroughs happening in the lab. So like three years ago, we created a partnership with the university in Sarajevo called the International Birch University. So we have 20 full-time biologists, chemists, people with PhDs in bacteria doing nonstop experiments. And we've been able to take a lot of our formulas and just take them to another level. So my favorite thing in the world to do is to run experiments, whether on myself, on marketing web pages, or 
with probiotics and enzymes. And it's been really rewarding and exciting to break through on a lot of stuff, which we'll start releasing later this year. That's awesome. And, and one example of a supplement that you guys have really innovated is magnesium. There are seven types of magnesium, I believe, in your supplement. Can you explain what makes this, why you have multiple kinds of magnesium in the supplement and what that does for the body? Yeah. So one of the things that we're proving to ourselves and we'll probably publish a lot of papers around it is the power of synergy and cofactors, which if you've been around the supplement space, you've heard of, but very few people, I've never seen a lot of, of quantifiable data around how impactful it actually is. So just for an example, just this morning, we proved, and we're doing red blood cell tests with magnesium. So we're seeing that if you combine magnesiums, you get synergy. So you get more uptake in the red blood cells. And we're proving that the cofactors are improving uptake 30 to 38%. So we've seen similar results across the board with almost everything where you've got this key molecule that you're, you know, there's got a lot of data around. But if you add the right things to it, it'll actually multiply or increase significantly the effects of that molecule. And that's really what cofactors do. And we're seeing that when you're combining magnesiums, there's definitely some powerful synergy occurring. And we, we knew that experientially because you know, if you've used magnesiums and you try magnesium breakthrough, you'll feel the difference. But now we're quantifying it in the lab. So that's exciting. Credit goes to Charles Poliquin, who is one of the greatest strength coaches of all time, had 400 Olympic athletes that he worked with. And he's the guy that told us, you know, try combining magnesiums. He was combining four. I used it. It was definitely quite effective. And I'm like, okay, how can we take this to the next level? So we just tested a bunch of mags and we started adding cofactors and ended up with magnesium breakthrough, which has been our best selling product. Oh, that's awesome. I've taken that for uh, many months. So let's talk about the vegetarian diets and, and diets in general, because let food be thy medicine, right? So if someone is taking a lot of supplements, but they're also consuming a lot of junk food or highly processed food, I mean, they're kind of going against uh, their own body and, and, and the supplements aren't going to make up the difference. So what sort of diet do you recommend versus Wade? Uh, is Wade still on a vegetarian diet? What are kind of the uh, lab results showing as far as... Um, best practices uh, for food and nutrition? Yes. For the last three years, we've been working on answering that question. It's a book that will be published by Hay House in September. Oh, wow. I love that publisher. That's a big deal. Yeah. We're really proud of the book. We're just in you know, the final, final edits. And yeah, it's over 350,000 words. It is a reference guide. We cover every type of diet. I'll share kind of the, the core message, which is that every diet works short term. We're talking about weight loss. The failure rate long term is 97%. But for health purposes, what you really want to try to do is figure out which diet works for you psychologically, genetically, and then you want to use blood work to optimize that diet. Like there's no best diet for everyone. And Wade and I, I, I used to be a keto zealot. Wade was a, a plant-based zealot. We argued for years and at, over time, we realized like, yeah, they can both work. They both work. And some people psychologically and genetically gravitate to certain diets and they just work better. So there are certain genes that'll make a ketogenic diet work better for people. Same thing with plant-based diets. And then depending on your goal, there's a lot of things you can optimize and change structurally on any diet to, to make it work. So for an example, if your goal is to build lean muscle mass, you need to be in a calorie surplus, you know, typically 300 to 500 extra calories a day. If your goal is to lose body fat. And again, every diet works on that. There was a guy that did a junk food diet. He was literally eating Twinkies and other junk food and was able to lose significant amount of body weight because he was in a deficit. Now where supplements come in, is more on the micronutrient side as well as you know what you could call like biological accelerators. So when most people think of nutrition, they're thinking about macronutrients, right? Protein, carbs, fats, and we could throw in fiber and calories. That's kind of the tip of the iceberg. But if you go below the iceberg, you know that's when you're getting into micronutrients and obviously probiotics and enzymes and things like that. And you know no matter what diet you're on, 
there's going to be certain potential deficiencies. Like if you're in a plant-based diet, you know, vitamin B can be a ba- major challenge. Obviously, if you're in a keto, a hardcore carnivore type diet, you might have some other deficiencies like vitamin C or some other antioxidants. So no matter what diet you're on, you got to kind of ideally be smart about it because there's people following plant-based diets or, or any diet that are just not paying attention to the micronutrients. And there's certain micronutrients like magnesium and potassium that are just very difficult to get from a diet. Like if you're on a ketogenic diet, you're not going to be getting enough potassium. You know, potassium is obviously very prevalent in potatoes and bananas and things like that. So if you're avoiding those foods, you're most likely going to be deficient. And magnesium is uh, just very difficult to get from food in on any diet. So if you want to be optimized, which is of course the key purpose and point of your podcast, you, you need to be smart about it and ideally use blood work, monitor where your levels are at, and then introduce things you're deficient in and continue monitoring to get to the to an optimal zone. Mm-hmm. Do you find that uh, people are copper deficient, and if so, what's the remedy for that? Yeah, copper. Copper is a hot topic in the biological optimization, biohacking world. You know, copper has a very tight relationship with zinc. So with a lot of these minerals, you got to make sure you're taking them in the right ratios. And again, it goes back to cofactors. Some people are very paranoid about taking too much copper because it can create problems. And other people are saying, oh, people have a copper deficiency. So Yeah, I'm paying attention. I was just consuming content around this yesterday. Most likely people are deficient, but again, you you need to make sure you're taking things in the right ratios because you can throw things off balance. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that it's very hard to address copper deficiency by taking a particular supplement that you need to uh, uh, make dietary changes in order to, uh, uh, to get the copper that's, that you're missing. Yeah. Bioavailability is always critical. And again, with food, a lot of times you're getting cofactors and you're getting kind of the the entourage of molecules that you need to metabolize. You know, we're talking about metabolism. What does that mean? It means that let's talk about food for an example. People think, okay, I'm eating food, thus metabolizing that food. Well, there's a whole process, right? Your body has to break it down. That's where things like enzymes and, and probiotics can help. Then your body needs to absorb those amino acids, that glucose, or those fatty acids. And then finally, there's another stage where your body will metabolize those amino acids or you know, store those essential fatty acids or store the glucose or utilize it for energy. So there's certain things you can take like enzymes and other molecules that can help you metabolize those molecules. And yeah, with the minerals, there's a whole, like magnesium, for an example, is a cofactor for probably about 600 different biological processes. So you want to make sure that you're ideally taking the right entourage of molecules with whatever you're trying to focus on, things like copper. Just taking things in isolation is usually not a great idea. How do you tell which supplements are right for you and which ones are not? Like I go to a holistic doctor who actually was a guest on this podcast, uh, Dr. Kirby Hotchner. And one thing he does that I actually uh, very much in alignment with is muscle testing or applied kinesiology. And he's testing to see whether a particular supplement or protocol is going to be right for my body and to what degree, which dosage is going to be ideal. He's like pulling on my ankles as he's doing this to check to see whether a particular dosage is right or higher or lower dosage and so forth. So is that something that you recommend or is there, you know, some other process that you uh, prefer to, to use to tap into what your kind of your body's intelligence to learn how, how beneficial a particular cofactor vitamin or supplement is going to be? I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of muscle testing, been doing muscle testing for about 12, 13 years, worked with a guy who's the best muscle tester I've I've ever met the millions of calibrations. If you read John Diamond's work, just some old book, I think it's called Your Your Body, Your Body Never Lies. I forget the title, but yeah, great content. And then if you read David Hawkins' work, I think David Hawkins kind of took a lot of those concepts to another level. And yeah, it's an incredible tool. Yeah. So, uh, so the book that he's most known for 
is power versus force. Yeah, I think it's probably his best seller is actually letting go the pathway of surrender. But yeah, power versus force was his uh, first title. And yeah, he he did, you know, and published quite a few calibrations and it's, it's great work. Where I really started to believe in muscle testing, I went to see a guy, we call him the wizard, lives, lives in Vancouver. He's a chiropractor. And he started doing all these muscle tests on me and he started telling me all these things that just, just kind of unknowable, you know, certain emotions I was feeling. He told me what I ate the day before, J just thing after thing. I'm like, okay, this, this definitely works. And I was able to uh, prove to myself doing all kinds of improbable things that it works. So it, it is a great tool. A couple of comments. One is it's a skill. So you need to practice quite a bit and I'll, I'll quickly show you a great solo tests you can do, which I've, this is my primary way because you don't always have other people to test with. But it's a great tool. Here's the big one. I was talking to another big muscle tester. He's a, one of the most successful chiropractors, another guy th that I know. And one thing he said that I think is really pertinent, he says, you have to keep muscle testing. Like let's say you muscle test that a supplement is good for you today. You should probably retest it in a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, because you know, it's possible your once your body's had enough that you should stop or take a break or cycle. So I would say at the very least every month, keep testing and, and keep retesting because you know, what's great for you right now might, might not be great for you next month. And vice versa, right? If you have stopped a supplement based on muscle testing and you set it in your drawer, you should probably muscle test to see if it's time to bring it back out. Yeah. Absolutely. So why don't you explain the, the solo test? You could call it the V finger method. So you get, you, you I, I like to use these fingers and I've learned the O-ring method, which is you do an O-ring with your pinky and your thumb or your uh, index and your thumb. And then, yeah, I'm not a fan of that. If you do a lot of it, you'll start really feeling it a little bit in your joints. This one is more subtle and it's also a little more stealth. You can kind of do it anywhere. So you just do a V with your index and your middle finger. And then you, when you have to hold things in mind, so you hold whatever the thing is in mind, for example, it's in my highest and best interest, so which is a great way to start a statement. It's in my heart, highest and, and best interest to take, you know, four K packs right now. And then I go weak or it's my highest and best interest to not take any K packs right now. And then I go strong. So you know, you have to make a statement in the now cannot be a question has to be declarative. And you always, in my opinion, want to start with this in my highest and best interest to, and then hold the thing, whatever it is you're calibrating in mind. And it's very fast. The thing about muscle testing is your nervous system gets turned on for a split second. It's literally a split second. It's maybe 200 milliseconds. It's very quick. So you have to, to practice timing that. And the kind of way to practice muscle testing is to go back and forth between uh, positive thoughts, high calibrating thoughts, and then low calibrating thoughts. And you'll, you'll start to pick up on what weak feels like, what strong feels like, and you just got to practice. So it's a very, very, uh, again, clean, uh, stealth method of muscle testing you can kind of do anywhere. Like mo most, if you're doing it kind of with your fingers in your laps, people won't notice. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what I primarily do. Of course, if I have access to people, I'll, I'll muscle test with them, but it's not always feasible. Yeah. And for that, you put your arm out. Does it matter which arm left or right? So the best muscle testers I know, they'll actually run both arms and, and like the Cairo, the wizard, we call him again, he, he's literally retesting the same thing, like six ways. Like he'll take the arm and go sideways in front and he's like just kind of double, triple checking. And then the coach I worked with, he would do things and he would triangulate. So when he was muscle testing as a group, there were three people and it, they would just kind of retest things to make sure. Because it's really easy to have a bias. So if you have a bias about something and just kind of the caveat with muscle testing, you have to be biasless, which is really difficult. You know, most people have biases about all kinds of things. So if you have fears, if you have concerns, if you have a bias, I would say uh, it's probably best to not trust your calibrations that much. And it's easy to be off. If you watch horror movies, if you listen to heavy metal, if you drank too much coffee, if your nervous system is compromised, your muscle testing is going to be compromised. So in a perfect world, you're really calm, you're relaxed, there's nothing bothering you, and you're testing things you have no bias about. So... And when you have biases, it's, it's critical use other people. Mm -hmm. So do you use muscle testing 
to, let's say, make business decisions, which vendors you're going to hire, that sort of thing? Yeah. Does it steer you wrong sometimes? Rarely. And to me, it's another data point. Like I don't, you know, I always say, take my muscle test with a grain of salt, even though I'm, I'd say I'm correct the majority of the time. I know there's a chance I'm wrong. I don't always just use that, but it's certainly revealed some things that I didn't see on the surface and was able to kind of suss out. And then most of the time it proves to be true over time. Do you think that you're communicating with your body intelligence or the universal intelligence or your higher self or some combination or none of the above when you're doing these muscle tests? I believe that you're accessing the field of consciousness and that consciousness is kind of the fundamental substrate that we're all in. So it's it's acting like like a Google search. And I know you're an SEO guy, so it's acting like a Google search where if something has happened or is happening, you can get an immediate yes or no on that. And the yes or no is your nervous system turning on. And if something is not true, it just stays off. So that's what I believe is occurring. You know, it's funny. We were talking before the recording about AI. And one of the things I dislike the most about AI is it's soulless. We didn't talk about that. We talked about how I, I thought it's theft because <laughs> we're not uh, giving credit to the originators that the training data is based on. But yeah, from a spiritual perspective, if you are tapping into the universal intelligence, the, the field to God, to all that is, and you're asking for guidance on what do I write about? What direction do I take the book in uh, halfway through? I'm on chapter 10 or whatever writing. Where do I go from here? An AI is not going to do that. It's just going to use all the previous training data of all the other books that have ever been written. And uh, you miss that spark of, of uh, divine guidance. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, AI is the the ultimate echo chamber. I mean, people have been using that term for the last few years on social media. But if you think about it, it's you know it's a body of work that's already been used and done and created, and it's using that to create these outputs, which the majority of people are going to be using to get answers. So in terms of new things, new creative works, new outputs, fresh outputs. It's going to truly limit that. So I think on the flip side, because, you know, I've been in copywriting for, for a long time and marketing, you know, I feel like the people that are going to do best with AI is going to be people that are actually hyper creative and can create a really compelling vision and to use these tools to save a lot of time on the executional side. But yeah, AI is going to be kind of the ultimate echo chamber and, yeah, it's going to be kind of an interesting divergence. I think some people will truly uh, stay away from it to create original work. But man, it, I think the majority of people are going to be sucked into it and primarily use that. So, Yeah. You know, Peter Diamandis, uh, one of his quotes that really stuck with me, I, I was in his Abundance 360 mastermind for several years. He said that there are going to be two kinds of businesses by the end of this decade. Businesses that are out of business and businesses that are using AI at their core. Yeah. I mean, AI is the ultimate pattern recognition technology. And obviously humans, we all have pattern recognition capabilities and AI is already better than we are by a long shot. But it's not just pattern recognition. It's also solution creation. So you recognize a pattern. And then if you have a winning pattern, you can use that to create you know, a, a new strategy or a winning strategy. And I think with on the health side, circling back to that, uh, and it's already beating a lot of doctors on diagnosing people, I think it's going to be revolutionary, our ability to, I mean, just to give you an example, like we're already using it with bioptimizers. So we have a guy, he's a molecular docking expert, and we're using software that allows us to literally save about 20 to $30 million in laboratory testing by running tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of molecule simulations to see what could work with that and how it could dock with receptors and things like that. So you know, in terms of a human being trying to do that, it's 20 to $30 million in lab tests. So I think there's going to be some really powerful solutions and outputs that are going to allow us to, to leapfrog on effectiveness on a lot of things. So it's going to be a mix. I think, I think people are going to lose a lot of 
creative capabilities, unfortunately. And on the flip side, we're going to get some incredible solutions. Yeah. You know, the key word, I think, in this exploration of this brave new world of AI is discernment. Discernment is one of my favorite words. I think not that many people have it. You know, I think that's where doing a lot of spiritual work and doing a lot of house cleaning and, you know, developing a lot of self-awareness, I think leads to discernment. Unfortunately, not a lot of people do that work. I think that's changing. I believe that's changing. I think people are slowly but surely, you know, progressing and, and doing a lot of the work. I think that's one of the benefits of the plant medicines. It's it's a tool that's kind of leading people in those directions. But, you know, I'm excited to see neurofeedback take off, which has been one of my, my top tools, favorite tools. Have you done 40 years of Zen in Seattle? I've done Zen five times. Then I've done a couple of other trainings outside of that. Wow. You want, you want to hear a crazy story? Sure. I love crazy stories. I did 40 years of Zen. Uh, so that's Dave Asprey's neurofeedback uh, week-long program for our listener who doesn't uh, know what that is. It's what, $15,000 for the week. And well, so my wife and I both went, Ryan and I, and it was phenomenal. I really got a lot out of it. And one of the best things I got out of it was memories from my childhood. I had a pretty awful childhood and I didn't have very many positive memories. So yeah, I had some memories unlocked that I hadn't had since my childhood. The funny thing happened though, a couple years after, just talking with God in the car silently through my head because my family is asleep in the car. My wife and my toddler son, or actually it was a baby at, the, at that time. And my sister-in-law and mother-in-law, we were all driving to either Orlando from Miami or vice versa. And I didn't have the ability to turn on podcasts or music because it would wake them up. So I start having conversation with God and with you know, my spiritual support team. And one thing that comes to me is that I could ask for more memories from my childhood without having to spend $15,000 <laughs> in a week in Seattle. And so I did. And you know what happened was about 10 times the memories that I got from a week-long program in Seattle came flooding in all at once after I'd asked for those memories, memories that I had not had since my childhood. And they all came flooding in as like one big download. Yeah, that's awesome. And I've had similar but different experiences many times. And yeah, I think- Oh, please do tell. <laughs> yeah, so when you train Theta, and when you develop the ability to access theta at will, also just a quick uh, breakdown of brainwaves. Theta brainwave states for our, our listener who doesn't know that. Yep. Yeah, there's like five, I mean, there's more, but there's like five primary brainwave frequency sets. And like right now we're we're probably somewhere between alpha, beta, or it's always a mix, by the way. Like you always have all of these waves, but sometimes certain waves will truly dominate like beta, which most people are in most of their waking hours. But if you meditate and slow down your brain waves, you'll get to alpha, which is described like calm, but alert. It's a heart opening experience. It's loving. It's, it's a good place to be. And when you do the resets or the forgiveness work at four years of Zen, that's typically what they'll train you in. If you slow down your brain waves more, you get down to theta, which Dr. Joe Dispenza calls it your body's asleep, but your mind's awake. It's a very accurate. And by the way, everybody hits theta twice a day. Once when they're falling asleep and they're starting to dream and they're aware of it, it's called your hypnagogic state. Then when you wake up in the morning and same thing, you're kind of aware of your REM dreams, That's you're in theta and that's hypnopompic. Now, with neurofeedback and meditation, you can train your brain to to go there without falling asleep. The challenge people have is when they hit theta, typically pass out. And that is, in my opinion, and uh, of course, a lot of the neuroscientists uh, talk to his opinion, the best place to download information. So you talked about spiritual guides. It's, it's kind of like you've got the clearest channel there. So it's quite possible that that's a, a dominant wave for you. But yeah, in terms of downloading visions, strategies, game plans, it's an incredible place to be. So it's a really powerful business tool and just life tool in terms of seeing the future. And then of course, then you need to go and do the work and make it happen. But yeah, it's just been an, an amazing tool for me. Mm. Have you ever had any kind of precognitive visions of something that's going to come 
to pass and then it did. Like w- one example that I learned about watching a, a clip of Paul Stamets getting interviewed on Joe Rogan's podcast. And he shared how he had this vision. He was on mushrooms at the time. He had a vision of all these cows in a field that were dead. Then shared a story of something that happened later. I don't know how much later, if it was weeks or years later, but it was not allowed into his cabin in the woods because of a fire or some sort of natural disaster. I think it might've been a fire. And so he really needed to get to that cabin because his manuscript was there for his book and he didn't have any other copies. So he found a way to sneak in past all the roadblocks and everything. And on his way back out, and it was really dangerous what he was doing. So there were fires everywhere and everything. He saw that exact scene of all these cows dead in the field. So curious to hear your precognitive uh, visions, if you've had any, or dreams. Yeah, less, for me, it's less dreaming. It's more, again, when I go to a theta zone. Yeah, it's happened many, many times. I mean, business-wise, it's it's been relentlessly happening where I'll see a very clear vision of a person. And, and we actually do this as a company. So on Mondays, we have something called Vision Traction Organizer. And we have all these future visions, things we want to happen, which typically are things that I'll see in my mind and we put it on there. And it's just been amazing to see person after person, like people that we just were kind of dreams, like people that, you know, for example, uh, are head of our lab and uh, nootropic formulator, just people that were like, it'd be incredible if we attracted this person and then they show up. It's happened to me several times where I heard a message and then the next day that person told me what I heard. So yeah, it certainly occurred many times. Yeah. So it sounds like when you were saying vision traction organizer that you are implementing EOS, uh, entrepreneurial operating system. Yeah, no, it's it's been an amazing tool. But what we do when we read out the VTO and like the, I'm talking the three year and the 10 year, the whole team holds that in mind. And I'm a big believer that when you hold things in mind with a group of people, that it's exponential. The communication, the transmission that you're putting out there, the power of it is exponential, which then increases the odds of you attracting that. And that's what we've seen time and time again. So literally we'll have 60 to 100 people holding whatever that thing is in mind for a minute. And that's just been amazing. It's been, uh, I'd say it's one of the highest ROI activities we do is is holding those things in mind. Mm, that's awesome. That's like the power of prayer. So you can actually move the path of a hurricane through group prayer. By the way, I had Gino Wickman on this podcast uh, talking about EOS and his entrepreneurial leap book and so forth. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, it definitely changed my life. Yeah, very cool. So the wizard, you didn't mention his name. Is he still in practice? Does he still take clients? The, the guy in Vancouver, what's his name? Yeah, his name, his name is uh, Stephen Reed. Yeah, he hasn't taken clients in a long time. He's still working. That's the chiropractor guy. And the other guy, his name is Clayton. Uh, he's retired, unfortunately. But yes, yeah, Stephen Reed, yeah, he's, he's the best chiro I've ever met. Yeah, he's in North Vancouver. And yeah, he's, he's special. So if you ever, again... I know he's been, he's got so much demand and hasn't taken a new client in a long time, but you know, if anybody can try to get in, uh, good luck. How about sleep? Let's talk about sleep for a bit. And I'd love to find a bridge between what we've been talking about in terms of spiritual concepts and sleep, because it's not just your body resting and repairing. It's also an opportunity for our soul to go wandering or learning and growing or making a difference. The astral plane or knocking on heaven's door to try and get in. Let's start our sleep discussion around kind of spiritual overlap with that. Yeah. One practical tip that I would recommend is it's a great place to start developing your theta capabilities. Here's my advice. If you're a night owl, which I am, then as you're going to sleep and you hit theta, instead of just kind of rolling over and passing out, try to hang out there. You know, even if it's just a couple of minutes, two, three, four, five minutes, it's a great place to try to develop mental endurance without passing out. It's a great place to communicate with your guides if you believe in that. It's a great place to hold visions. 
And then if you're a morning person, do that, but as you're waking up. So as you're waking up, stay in bed, again, with your eyes closed and try to hang out in that theta zone that, again, most people will just tend to wake up out of. So again, what most people do is they go to bed and when they hit, they hit that theta brainwave state, they just, they don't fight it. They just kind of turn over and pass out. Or when people start to wake up the same kind of thing, they just tend to wake up and get out of bed. But my advice is try to spend time there and you'll notice that you'll get better and better at spending time in theta without passing out or without waking up. And it's an incredible place to download information from consciousness directly. You know, I had a time where I I downloaded or was shown a vision when it was right before I woke up. I felt totally conscious and I got this ultra high definition image of a room that was like a music room. It seemed like it was maybe from the 1800s or 1700s, had these uh, older style of instruments in it, but it had a very beautiful, enlightened energy about it. And when I opened my eyes, the image of that room stayed overlaid on the background of the bedroom for, I don't know, at least 20 seconds. Not as an after image with reverse colors, but the correct colors. And then it slowly faded away like an after image would. Really wild, really beautiful. Have you ever had anything like that? No, I'm not very visual. So like when I've when I've done sense tests and learning tests, like visuals, my my weakest. I'm very kinesthetic and audio. So I'd say the sensations will linger. When I tap into a, a frequency, a field, I can hold that for a long time. Uh, but I'm not very visual. So I get most of my information clairaudient, not clairvoyant. But I did this session with uh, Angel Team Healing. I want to have Jerry Bedlington from Angel Team uh, on this podcast. He said he w- he would, so we just need to get that booked. But I worked with him on a recommendation, by the way, from a famous person that we both know, which I can't say publicly because he didn't give me permission to uh, disclose that. But he recommended Angel Team Healing to me. And wow, <laughs> I did the session they had all these legions of angels working on me, like clearing my third eye visor and doing all this stuff. And then I had these visions that, that next morning. <laughs> yeah, highly recommended. Angelteamhealing.com. Here's another take on your know, health and spirituality. Let's talk about the nervous system because I believe that when you're in a spiritual state, you're fundamentally in a parasympathetic state. And just to kind of give everybody just a quick primer on on how the nervous system works, you have this this spectrum. It's not a black and white situation. It's not an on, on off switch. You have this parasympathetic side, healing and recovery, digest and rest, all, all kinds of nicknames for it. But it's essentially where you're very calm, you're very relaxed. You could say you're in a Zen mode, Zen state. And again, like that's a spectrum from you're sleeping deeply to you're just calm but alert. Somewhere in the middle is you could call like it if, if parasympathetic is like a minus ten on the nervous system scale, then you got zero, which is a great place to be when you're conscious and awake. If you look at the Yerky dots in work, which I spent a lot of time studying because I was very deep in, in self defense and studying the nervous system for a long time, and it's Research that was done a few decades ago where they studied how stress impacts performance. And in a perfect world, you're kind of in that middle zone where you're not too relaxed because if you're too relaxed, your performance drops. And you're not too stressed because if you're too stressed, your performance drops. And then on the the other side, you got the sympathetic response. Some people call it fight, flight, freeze. It's essentially you're stressed. Now, again, for certain situations – you want to have a little bit of stress. I mean, if you're working out you know, hard, a little bit of stress is a good thing. But learning to manage your nervous system, in my opinion, transforms the quality of someone's life. And most people tend to wake up and they go right into a some level of a fight, flight, freeze response. They turn on their phones. They'll go to social media. Maybe they're driving to work, which driving is going to be certainly a, some level of sympathetic response especially here in Panama. And then, uh, you know, people work, 
you know, that's a high beta brainwave activity, which is going to be sympathetic. And then they come home, they're exhausted, pass out, rinse and repeat. So most people don't spend time kind of shifting their nervous system throughout the day. There's a lot of ways to do that. Obviously, meditation, taking a nap, non-sleep, deep rest, which I'm a personal uh, big fan of, taking magnesium, taking adaptogens, all those things will help you stay more in the middle, even under duress. So even when you're facing stressful things, if you're really doing a good job managing your nervous system, you'll be able to be far more resilient. You know, you'll notice that you're not getting overly stressed and, and panicking and having anxiety and all of these things. And I do think that, that that's where great sleep comes in. You know, and there's all kinds of data showing that, you know, one bad night, like one single bad night of sleep has all of these dire consequences. One, it destroys your DNA. It will activate epigenetics, which will increase the activity of tumor genes, cancer genes. Your hippocampus will get compromised. Your short-term memory is compromised. Your ghrelin, which is your hunger hormones, goes up like 28%. Your ability to burn body fat is compromised. Your blood sugar response. I was actually talking to a, a pro athlete recently, an endurance athlete, and he showed me that he's using a CGM and he had one bad night of sleep. He looked like a pre-diabetic the next day, like one bad night. So great sleep, I think, is critical to you know, really laying the foundation for a great day and, and being in a good mood. Because if you're not getting enough REM, REM is where there's a lot of memory consolidation, emotional processing. So if people are not getting enough REM for several days in a row, it's almost a guarantee they're going to be in a bad mood, which obviously it's a lot harder to be spiritual and to be calm and to be Zen when you're stressed out in a bad mood. So I think great sleep, you know, is, is foundational for great health and just to be the best version of yourself in general. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. So for our listener who's not familiar with adaptogens, can you elaborate? So adaptogens are typically herbs, but let's just call them molecules, which if you're not stressed enough, they will kind of get you to that center point that we just talked about, that that nexus between parasympathetic and sympathetic. And if you're too stressed, they'll tend to pull you back. In my opinion, the most powerful adaptogenic blend that I've ever tried coming out probably in May. Uh, so it's been developed by a new formulator that we're working with, 17 Chinese herbs. It's, it's the most experiential adaptogen I've ever tried. Oh, wow. So by the time this episode airs, that'll be out then? Hopefully, yeah. He's a neuroscientist. He's an absolute genius and it's it's incredible. So yeah, adaptogens have their place for sure. You know, when, Again, if you're noticing or just dealing with a lot of stress, adaptogen magnesium are, are incredible at shifting your nervous system over and, and helping you stay calmer and more resilient. Wow. This has been really uh, such a great conversation and it's a shame we're going to have to end it here uh, shortly. So if our listener had one thing to do, one next action to take to move the needle in terms of their sleep or their discernment or their overall health, longevity, what would it be? And pick something that we haven't already talked about. I'll do two. I mean, one is the learn muscle testing. I mean, I think it's the ultimate discernment tool back to that. But the other one is to try our new sleep breakthrough formula. We've been working on it for a year. Uh, we didn't get a chance to, to dive deep into it, but it's a lot of really powerful, healthy, natural sleep molecules, such as glycine, L-theanine, four different sleep minerals. It's got pharma GABA. And yeah, it's incredibly potent. Uh, it's a drink. And yeah, I know, I think Steven, you've got a code, which is sleepbreakthrough.com forward slash S-T-E-P-H-A-N. Uh, so check it out. Yeah, 10% discount code. We have a, a one-year guarantee on all of our products. So if for any reason it does not work for you, you can get your money back. And then we have another sleep product coming out in February called Dream Optimizer. So if you want lucid, vivid dreaming, this is the formula. It's completely different than the sleep breakthrough. It's a spray. It has 18 micrograms of melatonin per spray, and it allows you to get like the right dose, which for, I think most people are just mega dosing and overdosing on melatonin. I'm a big fan of using like 50, 60 micrograms, but it has other ingredients like California poppy seed, which really increases REM. So if you like lucid, vivid dreaming, you will love Dream Optimizer. So check that out as well. 
Awesome. Do you have a, a code for that too? We'll make sure that, again, your code works on both. But yeah, you can use uh, yeah, Stephen's code. Awesome. And do you have any online courses or anything where people can learn more from you? You're quite a genius. Yeah. All, you know, all the products that we do at Boptimizer is really my life's work. We do have a, an 84 day course. Obviously, we got the nutrition book coming out. We tend to give people a lot of information when they buy our products. We give books away. We have a, a book called From Sick to Superhuman. We have another book called The Brilliant Mind Blueprint. So if you buy the Nootropics, you get that. But yeah, we tend to just kind of give away information, give away courses because, yeah, I think people need to do the lifestyle stuff as much as they do the, the supplements and all the biohacking things that we do. So For sure. So I'll include a link to the 84-day course in the show notes for this episode as well. Yeah. People get that for free when they buy any Bioptimizer product. So Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Matt. This was fabulous. And uh, listener, apply some of this stuff. Don't just take this as uh, passive uh, entertainment or edutainment. Do something, make a difference uh, in your life and the lives of others by applying what you learn here. And we'll catch you in the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.